Hello everybody, I hope you are well. Thank you for making it along to the live. I am waiting for it to sink in and see it come live on my screen. And here we are. So I hope you're all well. Thank you, hello David. Hello, hello everybody in the chat. I hope you're going well. I hope everyone is good. Yes, I am on. If anyone could just say the audio is okay. Um, got a bit of a croaky voice tonight, so going to do my best with this one. Um, but yeah, if anyone could just say in the chat and just say that the audio is good, that'd be amazing. Hello, Donny. How are you? Hope you're good. So tonight we're going to discuss acoustic levitation. And this is quite incredible, acoustic levitation. I actually started to research the subject and I just stumbled into lots of really interesting things. The one guy that really stood out for me was Victor Scharberger. And he he's one guy, brilliant David, thank you. Hello Miss Dragon, nice to see you. Hello everybody. So yeah, um, Victor Scharberger was a forester and actually a pseudoscientist, but he invented so many incredible inventions. And we'll come on to him later, but he studied nature and he studied the movement of nature and first of all let's just give a breakdown to what acoustic levitation is so acoustic levitation is a method of suspending uh, something in air against gravity so it's using sound waves to actually create like a vortex which will actually be able to lift objects and this is it's usually done in an ultrasonic frequency. So this is a very low frequency that's not really audible to humans. So you won't really hear it. It's probably below like 30 hertz. And hello, everybody else in the uh, chat. Esther, hello, Esther. Uh, who else is here? David uh, Eagle. Nice to see you, my friend. How are you doing? Good to see you, mate. So... The ultrasound, ultrasonic frequencies are very low frequencies. They're not things you can actually hear. They're usually done on a very low vibration. But the first ever acoustic levitation experiment was done on the tube experiments. And we get that date again. And it was done by the August Kunt. And it was 1866. One of the, that, that special period of time just after the industrial exhibition and the industrial or the mark of the industrial age but this was a lot around a lot further this went back very very far this goes back to egypt samaria and i'll come on to that later but i'm just going to work through what we're doing here so basically the mainstream still refer to this as being a kind of theory and it isn't there is enough experiments done uh that actually show how this levitation works and it's all only done with usually done with polystyrene balls and very light objects and feathers and things like this but through sound waves you can make things levitate and you can actually find videos on youtube as well where people are doing experiments with didgeridoos quite incredible and yeah i was quite impressed with actually how much is out there when you actually start looking into it that isn't in the mainstream of course because this would defy a lot of things like gravity and stuff like this and it throws up questions but one of the most fascinating pieces of research i came upon when i was looking into all this was the bee and oh excuse me with a <laughs> can you hear my croaky voice a bit um but i came across the bee the bumblebee and th what I'm really interested in with the bee is how it, it, it was the size of the bee compared to its wings. It's very difficult for a bee aerodynamically for a bee to actually fly. It would actually be near impossible. So we had um, there. Obviously, you've got different types of bees. So you've got honey bees and various other types of bees that, you know, that are slightly different sizes. But the bumblebee is a very unique insect and this has baffled scientists for 70 years to how these actually fly now i'm going to relate it back to acoustic levitation in a minute but so it is in 1934 the french zoologist called antoine Mag magnan and his technician andre santé lag calculated that the bee was aerodynamically impossible so this was yeah, what was the date before? So we're looking at 18, 
uh, 66 was when the experiments were first done and then they decided in 1934 that this was impossible. So ever since this age, this has been so much research done into how bees are flying, little microchips attached to them to see how they work, uh, how they fly around and where they travel to. But bees are relatively large insects when, and you'd expect that when they like flap their wings that they would actually be very tired because they are flapping their wings at a 90 degree angle. So they don't actually flap them like this. They are actually flapping them forward, which is very interesting. So this is flapping at a very high speed, 230 beats a second, right? So beyond how the human eye can see it, obviously you could do it on a very um, like a time-lapse camera you, or, or a macro camera, you could set it up so the shots were in, you know, you could slow it down and actually see the beats of the wings. But it, visibly to the eye, you would not see that movement. That's 230 uh, flaps a second. Quite incredible. I was a, a, amazed by that. But you, things like the fruit flies, they are like very small and they are like 200 times a second. So this is still very fast. Quite amazing. But it was... So this is the official story. So this is what we're given. I'll just say a note with the beats of the wings. Mosquitoes do their beats per, uh, their wings are 400 beats per second. So <laughs> that is unbelievable. I mean, the speed that they're going at. And you would think if something was actually flapping like that, it would actually, it would actually make the actual insect very tired. But these don't get tired. Insects are very active creatures or a little um, whatever you want to call them creatures I suppose but um, it was Michael Dickinson and this is the official narrative so it was Michael Dickinson who published a study in 2005 in the National Academy of Sciences on the flight of the bumblebee and he gathered huge amount of high speed photography so he managed to see how these bees maneuvered and how they are moving around and what he found was that there that, that what i said he was he actually found that the beats that their wings are actually flapping forwards and not actually fly, in flight mode which i was unbelievable so what this is happening when when what is happening when the bee does this is it is actually now this isn't in mainstream science so this isn't the mainstream story so the mainstream story is they're actually lift still lifting that way so that seems kind of very strange to me that they are lifting up in the air that way but bees are actually creating a vortex around them now it, it seems so far out but this is what is actually and this makes a lot of sense to me um let me get a little picture up of the actual uh bee so we can see some of the bees um but yeah so right so basically um Next to the larynx, and that's the, the throat of the bumblebee, there is a tiny hollow tube that acts as a resonance cavity that accumulates a frequency. So the actual flapping of the wings is activating a frequency within the bee's throat. And this is creating, which is the larynx, the larynx. And this is, it, so it's just, just down on the bottom of the throat here. And this accumulates a free uh, a frequency, and when the bee starts being its wings, it reaches a it starts creating a sound frequency around it around it, and this is actually ultrasound. What you are seeing, so the bee when it's actually moving and actually traveling, and the way it can travel so fast because sometimes bees can travel up to six miles at fifteen miles per hour, like high speeds. They know exactly where to go and they travel in straight lines as well. So they are using, right, and, and again, this is a theory, okay, and not proven in the mainstream. But the mainstream fear, the mainstream idea or concept does not make sense. It really, to me, it's, it's still baffling. Well, still, how are they getting up? Why are they not tired? Why are they not? I mean, you know, imagine spreading your wings and then flapping them for the. <laughs> 230 beats a second you'd be quite tired with your arm after your arms doing it like that wouldn't you so you know they, they've got these very sophisticated creatures insects so 
this accumulates a frequency and it will be the frequency that will match its environment, right? So it's 8.5 hertz and this allows and it creates through the ultrasound, it actually creates, uh, let me get that off, um, but it actually creates a vortex, a vortex. And basically around that, that bee is able to maneuver and it maneuvers through the magnetism of the earth. So it's actually flying. So that when, when you see how direct and how fast they fly, they are literally pulled to their hives of, in this sense of magnetism. Now, again, that is not a mainstream theory, a mainstream idea, but in the sense of the concept of it, it came around in, I think the 60s and 70s is concept. And very interesting. I uh, really, really feel like this is the way bees are, tr are, 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 are flying. And the um, bees are absolutely fascinating creatures because they communicate through dance and sound as well. And this, this is really fascinating how these are operating. And they're also bringing it on to the recent years, the way we've had this kind of, the way the bees have been almost got rid of, this frequency that's been put into the air is actually apparently knocking out the bees' um, field of field of frequency. So I, again, I find that interesting. It's almost like there's been a little attack on the bee, bee community over the years. So, so and also as well, with the experiments that um, uh, Michael Dickinson done, you've got to remember that they were done in a lab. So how, how could you create that environment and actually uh, recreate the outside environment in a lab? So if this bee was levitating in that sense, in, in the way I explained it, in, in creating this vortex through... Um, yeah, so just so I explain that a little bit more, if you look at Victor Scharberger's work and how he created the, the... He talks about the vortex engine and the vortex energy, right? So this field of energy is round the bee. So it's almost like the bee is actually you know, creates this sound resonance around it and then it moves around in the magnetism that, that it is. So I, absolutely mind-blowing that was. And, but there's more to that as well and I will come on to that as well. But in the physical world, uh, the human world, we have a John Hutchinson and he did a lot of, a lot of um, acoustic levitation experiments uh, back in the 70s and he was actually getting objects, heavy objects, to levitate, levitate whilst they were tearing towards the ceiling. Metals are oddly contorted into strange shapes and resembled like jelly and different materials fusing together. Um, and, and he was influenced, which I didn't know about. You, some of you guys will know on the channel that, that previously I've, I've talked about John Hutchison before, but I didn't know that he actually used Tesla's plan so to to build these te tesla coils and you can see in the video the way these objects are moving this is all very real and this was done in sound frequency this was done with ultrasound ultrasonic frequencies and incredible incredible guy and I, I fascinating so yeah john hutchison and again this is not really being picked up in the mainstream and this is a free energy type of technology that actually does defy gravity and obviously that would probably be a reason why it wasn't brought up in the uh, in the mainstream. Hello, everybody who's just joined chat. Hello, Red Eye, Paradox, Paradox Flora Fossils, Esther 12. Nice to see you. Hello, everybody else outside of the chat. Thank you for making it. Um, but this incredible guy. So check out John Hutchison. He's done some really incredible experiments. And I, again, I just don't think they were followed or taken into the mainstream. They, they, he is acknowledged, but not in a, a massive capacity and and this is free energy this is moving objects with sound so i'm sure a lot of you know and i'll come on to that a bit later but obviously we've got the pyramids as well so a uh, pyramids is another was another way of acoustic levitation or possibly but <laughs> i don't think they moved these huge stones on um uh, you know, on sticks and rolled them up and did it the way that, you know, some of the narratives tell us about. But right, so what we do here is just get rid of this image and then I'll come back to me. 
Um, oh, we won't come back to me. We'll come back to that. And oh, there we go. So the Victor Scharberger, he was an incredible guy. And he was um, was born in Austria on in 1885. And he was a forest caretaker, a naturalist and a philosopher, inventor and pseudoscientist. But his inventions were way, way beyond science. And he's very, very dismissed. And it's sad. It's a very, very sad go- uh, story with, like a lot of people that invent these free energy devices in the past, they, they've they been kind of rejected out of society. And sometimes very serious, you know, other things happen, disappear as well. And it's, it's a very common trait or common thing that's happened uh, over the years. But yeah, he was wasn't obviously a trained scientist but you know he his inventions were way advanced and he developed what was called the implosion theory and this is where he states that energy that that general energy generation by means of explosion like petrol engine cars and nuclear energy is destructive and harmful to the environment but implosion technology on the other hand is in in it is an increased concentration of energy and it's reusing the energy it creates. So it's imploding the own, its own energy into itself and making its own system. Kind of a bit like I, yeah, so got relating back to um, sort of John Hutchinson, what he was working at, but it's a slightly different uh, acoustic type of levitation, what, what Victor Scharberger, he did lots of different types of um, energy devices, Victor Scharberger. So Victor Scharberger was, unfortunately, he was pulled into World War II and he got pulled into the National Socialist Party, which I don't think he wanted to be part of. And he actually created what was called the Repulsing, which was a flying saucer that he <laughs> developed for the, the National Socialist Party, uh, National Socialist Germans. And during World War II, and... This was based around the implosion-based propulsion system that Victor developed. And it's, he actually worked on uh, later onto the Vortex engine as well. He helped, that was a part of some of his research went into the Vortex engine as well. So he, this, he actually invented a UFO for the National Socialist Germans. And then he also, for the Finnish, uh, Finnish um, uh, uh, government, he actually made a UFO as well which they he could actually or believed this could actually create anti-gravity effects um but sadly after he did that second ufo um quite incredible really to invent a ufo but this is what the story is that we're given this is all public information you can find out um he was put in a mental asylum and that was it very sad um you know after he did that and you can see uh, let me just get a bit of Victor up so you can see a bit of his work. But yeah, he was he was a megaly talented guy. And oh, where's it gone? Oh, where's he? Where are you gone? Oh, disappeared somewhere. Oh, there you go. Behind there. There we go. So yeah, it's going flowing a bit better tonight, guys. Cutting up on the lives I am. So have a look at so this is Victor Scharberger. And you can see he used water and being uh, an, a naturalist and a forest caretaker, he he was able to, he spent like 30 years in nature observing how energy flowed. And you can see his picture here. This is probably after he was put in the mental asylum. Very sad. A very and, and I fell, you can see one here, one of his machines that he invented. And this was uh, an energy, a vortex machine for water. But this, the plans you see here was the implosion plans that he built that actually where it imploded, uh, the energy imploded on itself and was recreated, like recycled. Right. OK, so I'll come on to any questions, guys, or any. Um, any uh, anything you ask in a minute. All right. So I'm just going to go through all this and then we'll plug on to the questions. But yeah, Victor Scharberger, his. um uh, his motto was comprehend and duplicate. So, you know, observe, observe nature, see how this is operating. And you can actually start to see how the movement of energy works. And, 
you know, it's all there, guys. It's all out there. We have, you know, obviously we need to adapt it into uh, uh, technical machines, but it's it's all there. So, right. Sorry about my voice, guys. I'm just gonna have a drink of water. But yes, um, basically another one which I was just like, you know, I saw these when I went to California uh, ten years ago, and I remember watching all the hummingbirds come along, and they were it was up in the mountains and they were just taking uh, from this bird feeder. They were just coming along and, and it was amazing watching these, these hummingbirds. But again, these are birds that actually don't, um, so they beat their wings. This is really, really mind blowing. So hummingbirds beat their wings in a figure of eight pattern and they actually create a sacred geometry circle. So they are actually, when they're back, they're the patterns they make, it's actually creating like a, a sacred geometry symbol. Uh, I tried to look for the symbol. I couldn't find any of that. But it, you can imagine if it's doing a figure of eight and it's doing that, I believe they fly, I think it's around something like 200 beats per second hummingbirds. So you're looking at, again, like the, the bumblebee, very interesting that but they are uh, and when they hover the hummingbirds beat their wings back and forwards and downwards so they they're literally going like this and in creating a sacred geometry pattern so maybe that pattern is some way aligned in in to the planet and is actually is is allowing that bird to maneuver along ley lines the grid of the planet the magnetism of the planet or the magnetism to various other locations who know it, it, it this is incredible but the, the these birds also uh let me just mute that uh because i've got that sound i've got my little computer on i just had to check it was on but these um birds they they can fly in any direction so and up to 60 miles per hour literally like because that was fascinating observing them when i saw them years ago is how quickly they moved literally and you in a blink of an eye, they're gone. And it, it's, it's too quick to even sometimes observe, observe these things. But that, that I found that very fascinating. And yeah, again, Western science doesn't support this idea. It's saying that they're, you know, using the aerodynamics. And we'll come on to aerodynamics a bit later. But it, it was... I don't think these are. I think these could be possibly creating a field of sound, like maybe why that is called a hummingbird. Maybe ancient history. I didn't actually look into the, the history of how far hummingbirds go back, but maybe the hummingbird is connected to that. But also from studying the architecture of, of the old world and, and seeing that, I've actually seen the the Cardiff Castle that was the the location. Um, there is some very interesting paintings that have been applied at a later date, and it would probably have been when William Burgess was actually designing that place. And I noticed that the Darwin they had the uh, I, I, I think it was they were mocking Darwin's theory of evolution. So the the designer was doing a direct attack, but in there was monkeys up on the ceiling in this castle. So in these in these sacred geometry patterns, it was very obscure, very different from the sacred, the, the actual original old world architecture of the building. But then also well placed in, within the monkeys were hummingbirds. Just an idea. I mean, very interesting that. So maybe the two theories kind of clashing together. Maybe Maybe hummingbirds were something much more in in the part or they still are but they're just not looked at in that way they looked at in this way we <clears throat> the way we see science so um another fascinating insect is the ladybird and slightly different um but the way they take they actually take off vertically and again they actually have well they actually have four sets of wings so they are creating some sort of pattern um amazing incredible and you know when people say it's in your face right so there we go maybe it is maybe these bees and animals are operating in this way but the way we, we read 
the science in the way we've been taught science and the way we have been conditioned with science we see it like like that that is going to be the way we read it it's not going to we're not going to read it in these terms of frequencies and and ultrasonic sound and stuff like this and acoustic levitation we're not going to see it like that so i uh, yeah incredible but there's more and there's a lot more but i'm not going to go through all the animals <laughs> the animal kingdom that do these uh incredible form of acoustic which i believe to be a form of acoustic levitation when they maneuver but this was incredible and it's not so much acoustic levitation acoustic levitation but it's more what the victor scharberger was getting at and these are the japanese flying squid and this was wow these are incredible right so the Japanese flying squid, it's native to the Pacific, North Pacific Ocean, and it specifically around South Korea, Japan, and China and the Russian Federation. Uh, the female is like much larger than the male, growing up to 50 centimetres long. They can change colour to match any environment, helping to camouflage them from any predators. But the Japanese flying squid uses jet propulsion to speed through the air it does this by taking water into its mantle and it actually has a muscular cavity that protects the squid body and it pushes it out like a siphon and shoots forward so this animal or fish or squid is actually using a form of free energy it is actually almost like a propulsion system in itself and these uh so powerful this jet propulsion that these japanese flying squids can propel themselves out of the water and glide spreading them out their fins and arms creating like an aerodynamic lift and then once they're in airspace they can travel up to 11 meters per second now that is unbelievable 11 meters per second the speed of that and apparently the reason why they fly is because it's actually quicker obviously to escape predators and things that want to catch them but they actually fly faster than they can actually swim and uh, i i was blown away with that incredible but unfortunately yeah these, these are eaten as well because and they are used as a form of um you know it's a, ugh, everything gets eaten doesn't it and every sacred animal we have or amazing incredible animal we have on this planet it always ends up in some restaurant menu somewhere which you know yeah i mean i've eaten squid but not fly i mean yeah years ago but i i don't think i could now <laughs> um but yeah so they travel five times faster through the air than they do in the water i i was just blown away with that unbelievable so they're using a vortex vacuum, which is where they, where they propels them out of the water. So it's not so much acoustic levit uh, acoustic levitation, but this is what I just found out on the uh, on my research. But it's using a similar way that Victor Scharberg, some of his energy devices, and I believe Tesla had these plans as well. So really, they were replicating certain parts of nature as well. So again, you know, observe nature, see how it works, how it functions, create, you know, how it's creating energy. And this, we can apply this to our world and the physical, you know, technological uh, world we're in. So, <clears throat> so look, uh, yeah, so that, that was incredible. So yeah, I mean, it's Victor Scharberger, it's studying nature, looking to Victor Scharberger because... There is quite a few books out there you can read on what he invented and how he came about these inventions. And it's quite amazing. He's He is, one of, one of I find, one of the most amazing guys. So, hello, John Keeley, Enslaved by Truth. Hello, Enslaved by Truth. Red Eye, I've said hello to you, mate. Uh, John Keeley, hello, 420 Southwest. Hello. <coughs> Excuse me. I love you. Kisses from Portugal. I love you too, Yellow. How are you? Brown Dwarf, how are you, my friend? Yes, well, look, here we go. And yeah, it's a bit of a different one tonight because I just wanted to change the rhythm a bit of everything. So I thought it'd be interesting to look at all this and also with acoustic levitation and giving you some techniques as well and possibly things for you to research and look into. And maybe someone out there has a good workshop. They can build these devices and start spreading it out and putting it into communities and let's get some of these free energy devices made. 
So when we look at aeroplanes, and this is, uh, you know, aeroplanes are quite incredible, really, when you look at the way they're created and the, that they move through the air. Um, a lot of people don't realise, but when planes, planes are actually only using petrol when they thrust and actually take off. When they're in cruise control, they don't actually run using petrol. Now, the, the engines they use, they actually is able to create like the certain vortex around the plane, which actually allows it to move. Not exactly that on all planes. It's different. There's various different types of planes. But the cruise control I found interesting because, yeah, it's actually is actually using the air currents. And, you know, some people will say that it's actually using the ether. Maybe, maybe it is. Maybe. Um, we, we, I mean, you know, pilots say some very interesting things. But yeah, planes have always been a fascination for me. I, I've you know, especially over London, because we look at all these, um, we look at all these planes flying over, and we just think, wow, okay, so they're, they're actually, you know, these are like what 30, 40 tons, probably more in some cases, and yeah, I, 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 I just fascinating to observe because you're seeing how the aerodynamics works and. Um, the basics to aerodynamics, the laws of aerodynamics, the principles, fundamental principles, are governed by the, how the air behaves around the objects in motion. In aviation, these laws are essential for understanding the principles of flight and how aeroplanes are able to take off, fly and land. So the four aerodynamic laws in aviation terms are lift, weight, thrust and drag. So that's interesting to how that interacts with the environment around it. And obviously, not all planes have vortex engines, but the vortex engine is able to create a field around the plane, which will actually create a pocket of air, which will actually help it lift, it, um, push, it, push it forward itself. So, yeah, so bear that in mind. When you're watching a plane actually in full cruise control, high up in the air, it doesn't actually, it's not actually got, uh, pet is not running from the petrol so it is using a type of free energy but the vortex engines are really incredible sophisticated engines that actually create like almost like a vortex type around them which does lift the plane incredible but um but all that is of course uh, excuse me i keep going croaky so thank you for everyone and yeah thank you to anyone that's joined um yeah um Hello, everybody. Hello, Yellow. Yes, I've said hello to you. So, greetings, sir. Hello, Brown. Dwarf, how are you doing? Well, I don't think it's all a hoax. I do think that in the machines that they're built, Red Eye, they do need to have a lift. There's no there's no way a plane could just run on free energy along a runway it would in the machines and the way it's built. But when it gets into high altitude, that could be a very different matter. Um you know, and, and also, well, bear in mind the way engines are built underneath the plane. Um, if they were ex emitting, because a lot of people think they've got this, this that they're emitting like uh, like a heat or a gas in that way. But it's it's not not in that way because they'd actually burn the wing, wouldn't they? If, if the actual, uh, yeah, you, you can see the engine I've got on the screen at the moment, which I'm going to take off because I'm doing all these uh, sign language and you're not seeing any of it. But uh, on the plane window, you've got, uh, sorry, the plane wing, uh, you've got the engine underneath, don't you? Because, but so if that was shooting out hot uh, energy, it would actually burn the wing, um, but it doesn't because it's actually what I believe it's actually creating, although Vortex engines are creating a pocket of air, which is actually pushing the plane within itself. So it's incredible. Uh, they are, planes are absolutely amazing. But again, this is all according to gravity. And then we only have to realise that it's Sir Isaac Newton that was one of the first aerodynamicists. And he was actually the guy that established the theory of air resistance. And so, you know, Sir Isaac Newton, and that was in 1726. You know, you have your own opinions on that. I mean, you know, uh, Sir Isaac Newton said an apple drops on the head. And that proved gravity. So, you know, that was, was a bit more to it than that. But that's kind of the short answer. But um, it was in 1799, uh, Sir George Gat Cayley uh, recognised the aerodynamics of, of force, of, of uh, weight, lift, drag and thrust, which we were talking about earlier. So, again, it's in that period of the 1800s, well, just 
just before the 1800s. But it was like that build up, you see. So it was this reconditioning, reformatting of this this technology. And, you know, there's no, again, no proof of that. But we can say that that's something, well, they, they, that's a strange time period. Because then, obviously, the Victorian period, all the plans disappeared. Everything went, went phew, where did that go? And, you know, you could be re, reconfigured, I would say. So it was in 1871, apparently, that the uh, uh, Francis Herbert Wenham uh, built the first wind tunnel, which gave the precise measurements of the aerodynamic impulses. So it allowed them to measure how they had to build certain planes, um, according to Sir Isaac Newton's uh, theory of gravity and stuff like this. Well, well because gravity has never been proven as far as I know. So we can't, I mean, it's something we've gone with as, a, as an idea, but it's never actually been proven. Uh, and how you prove gravity exactly, um, I don't think you can prove it by dropping something to the floor. There's a lot more involved in it than that. So it was the Charles Reynold, a uh, French aerial nautical engineer, was the first to predict the potency need for sustained flight in 1889. And then you had the uh, Wright brothers, which I'm sure a lot of you know about, in 1903, which who did the fourth, the the first flights of their own, and and researched it into the the wind tunnel and developed their own planes and stuff like this. But all planes are, are based around them four principles, and the. Uh, where are those principles? Which is weight, lift, drag, and thrust. So they are the four principles of flight. So aeroplanes are designed around them, that that, that science. Um, but yeah, if we go back to Victor Scharberger, um, that's all out there as well. He in, he created what was called the repulsion. He actually patented uh, the, the the actual plans for this. Uh, so, and that's that publicly out there. That's not any hidden information. So again, I'm interested, find it interesting the mainstream don't pick up on that. It could be an amazing documentary. It might actually re help the mainstream come back into a good a good light with people, right? Oh God, I'm getting squeaky. My gosh. So, <clears throat> so what? Where are we? So let's get down to. I've just got a few notes here. I'm just got working through. So the designing of um, aircraft of supersonic hypersonic flight as well as desire to improve the aerodynamic efficiency of current aircraft and propulsion systems um, like con continue to uh, drive new aerodynamics research so it is changing a lot all the time there is so much happening in the sense of engines and how these free energy systems are being created and the more knowledge and information that we retain and we actually remember it seems that we're, we're actually developing a new new types of engines new types of crafts and new ways of traveling um, but you only have to look at the uh, repulsing and what Victor Scharberger did to realize that this technology is very real and probably not in the public domain uh, that side of technology. So you had the, um, where are we? So you had the, the famous, um, so going over, so yeah, where are we now? So famous French spiritualist and Buddhist who became an explorer and uh, known as Louise uh, Alexandrine Marie David, who most knew as Alexandra David Neil. And he visited central Tibet during 1924 when it was forbidden for foreigners. They didn't know that actually Tibet at that time was forbidden to foreigners. Interesting why it was, because Tibet holds a very, a lot of sacred knowledge and this knowledge of acoustic levitation. Uh, the, the monks and the Tibetan monks and all these, the way they trained, they, they did use this kind of sound technology to actually manoeuvre things. Now, they would never show that to anybody. If you look and actually some of the pictures, monks don't like getting pictures taken of them. They were very aware that this was a Western bit of technology and it would have been traced back and they didn't want that technology to be go everywhere. They did want to keep it in, in, a, in a kind of sacred way. But the monks... So this... Um, Belgian, the French spiritualist and uh, uh, Louise um, Marie David, 
He basically um, observed Buddhist monks using singing bowls to levitate huge rocks and stone circles outside of the Buddhist monasteries and repel demons and negative entities. Now, this was recorded on the 1st of January 1929 in his book Magic and Mystery in Tibet. So there is books out there, information out there about this. And I'm, I'm sure you can find, uh, I found, I didn't actually put them onto this video, uh, sorry, the live, but there are actually images of, um, old black and white images of Tibetan monks using the cone-like objects, which, you know, I'll come on to, that they are actually go back to Samaria. And this leads me on to... Um, there, there is actually someone else, actually. There is actually another guy, a German-Canadian polymath and explorer, Theodor Ilon, travelled to uh, Tibet um, in Western uh, uh, Tibetan Plateau. And he wrote in The Secret Tibet in Disguise Amongst Lamas, Robbers and Wise Men. He observed uh, lamas and Buddhist monks using massive singing bowls to, to, to move large rocks and stones up hills. So... Maybe that's why people, foreigners, weren't allowed in Tibet. Maybe they were using a type of technology that the Tibetan monks didn't want other people, especially the Western explorers at that time. They didn't want them to know about. So, you know, that's something to bear in mind. Tibet is a very ancient civilization. It was probably one of the last t countries that were using this type of technology and obviously, if you know to the history, it's barbaric. It's absolutely awful what happened to Tibet in the last 20 years. I don't even know if it exists as a country in the same way as it did now. But there there are still these monasteries existing in certain places, which would be very well out of the way of any humans to go. And you couldn't just walk into these buildings like you can in churches and stuff like that around in the Western world. These would be very, very guarded. And rightly so, because, um, you know, people... There was a lot of people at that time going around trying to gather this information, and especially in World War One and Two, the, the the covert missions that went on, where people were actually going into other locations and finding this old technology and sacred technology. But yes, another guy. Um, I'm going to sort of end up on this guy, and then I'll come over to the questions. But fascinating, and he built. Uh, this was Edward Lead Scalanin. And he built Coral Castle in uh, Florida, which is Florida, USA, between 1923 to 1951. And Coral Castle is, uh, I'll put something up on the screen here because I've got some little clips. There's Edward there, very incredible man. He was actually five, just under or just over five foot, but he built this whole castle, apparently. No one ever saw any other workers on the site and he apparently was only observed by two children that saw him when and they actually observed him holding two cone-like objects with a, a, a very low sound frequency on and he was using these cones to actually maneuver the objects around now it's 1,100 tons of stone structure. Nobody ever heard any building works there. And yeah, I, an interesting time period as well, 1923 to 1951. He was from Latvia as well. Interesting, very interesting guy he was. Now, he was using like a foam cup um, for this, uh, and it levitating sometimes 20, like 28 ton rock. I mean, what the this is amazing but the mystery is still surround oh there's still a lot of mystery around to how it was actually done um there is no direct proof of that he actually did maneuver uh, uh maneuver these rocks with with levitation techniques but it, it, he's a very peculiar interesting man and uh yeah he's got some but the cone light -like objects that he was using they actually and, and i didn't actually get any up which is a shame um, I haven't actually got any pictures of them, but you can search them online and they are like cone and they actually go back to Sumerian, Sumer Sumeria back in 3,000, 3,500 BC. And there's also 
so yeah look into that because there's some area that you'll see the like cone like and it's also in south america there's also these cone like stone objects that were found like very bizarre i mean what they are exactly i don't know but maybe the stone was like attuning to the frequency in of the sound of the environment I, you know maybe it, it was activated in some way maybe the stone was a type of magnetized i don't know any comments on that would be great, actually. If anybody knows anything out there about what I'm talking about and wants to interject, please do. Uh, let me just have a look over. So, right, okay, interesting, Mike. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, I to be honest, I've actually never... So, Red Eye, just back to your question, I've never actually heard of the jet fuel hoax uh, I never actually knew there was a, a hoax on that. Um, you know, from what I've seen, when I've gone to the airport and I look at a plane, I see it getting filled up with with a tanker. So, um, you know, I it, it maybe um, so there must be fuel going in it, and to thrust in, it must be going up. Yeah, David. So you're interesting with the, the uh, total eclipse. I'm fascinated with that. Um, yeah. I, there's been a lot of fear talked about it as well, I've noticed. There's been certain figureheads coming out on mainstream TV saying, you know, we must be careful. There's what's going to happen, you know, and, and get your supplies in and stuff. And I'm like, that's pretty for serious. So maybe, and obviously they're doing the um, Hadrian Collider as well at the same time. Is that, I might be wrong, but I, I really am out of any mainstream. I really just go into my own research and like looking at things in, in my own space. I tend to just ignore the mainstream stuff going on at the moment, I just ignore it. I, I don't want to really know about it. Um, it doesn't really fill me with any um, joy or happiness. So just going to come back to the final one, but the uh, the similar theories they had with the ancient stone structures like the pyramids. And the, the pyramids were probably built like this. I can't see the official story being holding up to be correct like you know they 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 rolled these stones or carried these stones with uh, huge numbers of people but yes there i mean these the pyramids were built like this and i think all old world technology old world buildings were at some point built like this maybe even the ornate buildings obviously you know and and that might explain why certain buildings were built for example in the world fairs for certain time periods maybe they were using this technology uh you know that's a possibility um or they could just be there already and they just took it over and said i built that and that's mine <laughs> but um yeah the, the pyramids are an interesting and the pyramids all over the world uh you know there's so many structures like this that were built with huge granite stones that were, would have been near impossible to actually move but um and stonehenge the start the stone circles around the world you know like that's another way acoustic levitation was working in this way so acoustic levitation is very real we can just see from the micro experiments we've done that, uh, sorry that well we'll say we not me but like humans us humans have done that we we that, that, that this this is very um very possible and very real um, but yeah, I'm going to end up on a quote from the guy, Edward Lee Scallin, then, and I'm going to come over to your questions in a minute. And his quote, which I was pretty blown away with, so this was Edward, the guy that built Coral Castle, said that I have discovered the secrets of the pyramids and have found out how the Egyptians and the ancient builders in Peru, Yucatan, and Asia with only primitive tools raised and set in place blocks of stone weighing many tons. So that was quoted from Edward Lee Scalinin. And I advise everybody to look into his work and very scarce to what actually how he did that. But there are other people that have done theories and drawn up plans in other ways to explain his work as well. So check him out. But also I'm sure I know some of you will know Victor Scharberger on the channel. Do check him out. Incredible. So yes, thank you everybody. That's the lot for the actual talk on acoustic levitation. I'm going to come over to your questions now. 
So David, yes, I'm back to the total eclipse question. David, um, yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody out there, we've got nothing to fear. Um, I'm sure a lot of strange things happen during an eclipse. An eclipse is a very strange event in itself, considering, you know, the alignment to that and how precise that is. And I believe we are the only planet that experiences an eclipse. I might be wrong there, but in the sense of that, there it's quite a rare phenomena that we actually have. We have eclipses. But yeah, there, there's a lot of fear around it. I would ignore the fear. Again, don't get pulled into the mainstream there. But interesting. And please tell me, David, I'm interested to see what will happen. And tell me uh, next week. But I don't think it, uh, it will be anything bad. So I wouldn't worry. The engine essentially chops up the ether, creating a high electromagnetic charge across the wing. Also, this is crude elevation method. Nice, Mike. Very nice. Yeah, well, that's really cool. And, and that makes sense, right? In, in there's, there's different ways, I suppose, that it could harness the energy and, 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 and create the energy. But, but the, um, the Vortex engine is actually creating a, a field of thrust that's thrusting itself. And they are very sophisticated engines. Quite incredible. And we can actually do like a real lot. I don't know why we don't have, we could, couldn't create a vortex engine in a car it would make sense you know i'm no scientist or builder of cars or these kind of things so i don't know i'm just looking at it in an artistic perspective and seeing how it could it could work i i have a i suppose i'm a bit of a pseudo scientist you know i i look at things in a very abstract way and 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 see outside of it i look at things inside out sometimes as well i think it's always good to look at another perspective what i don't like about science is is, is it's so definite with its answers and this is the way it is and there's so many aspects of different things that could change that concept so i find that very bizarre so um bees yeah cool nice bees have hollow tubes like dragonflies yes dragonflies incredible creatures and they're they're operating but again i think they have four wings right or maybe even eight maybe but yeah incredible creature and they fly in any direction now they're quite heavy the bodies to them as well so that makes sense yeah yeah Wow. Okay. Really, David, that'd be amazing. Well, I'd be incredible to watch it from a plane. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if I'd feel, I don't know. I don't know if I want to watch it from a plane. It'd be quite amazing though. Wow. That'd be incredible. Well, I hope the pilot can see. <laughs> I've got a very squeaky throat. Uh, I've got, I came down with a cold yesterday and I've been trying my best. It's nearly gone. It went quite quickly. I was drinking lots of lemon, but it took a little while. Resonate carrying sound, electromagnetic energies across the wings. Incredible. Yeah, and this is why I believe a lot of insects, if you think mosquitoes are going at like 400 beats per second, that's nearly twice as fast as a bumblebee. So even mosquitoes could be creating this field, of, of, of uh, creating a frequency field. Uh, and going back to the bees, what's fascinating about the bee is, um, is that, that, that when I, I've gone close to a beehive and, and seen like a whole series of beehives and is the hum coming from these hives, it's, whoa, I mean, really healing, really healing. And obviously you can't just go, you have to wear the whole suit and everything when you go and play around with the bees, but it's um incredible. Yeah, so group thinks, okay, so yeah, uh, starfish troopers podcast um hello scarabs too right okay cool yeah well look add anything else guys add any uh, other creatures insects animals into the chat and, and and let's chat about it well yeah you you mentioned june more deep that's right well the original june actually had more deep which were the sound weaponry which actually they dropped in the later one which i don't understand why they did that that's a shame because actually I thought that was one of the best aspects to the original June, the David Lynch version. I, that's kind of my love, that original. I do like 
the next two Dunes. I thought they were very well made and, and really good stories, brilliant cast and really liked them. But that was, I thought it was a bit corny, actually. They were using swords, right? What a bizarre concept that... Now, I'm sure you guys know, or some of you know, but the third Dune is quite incredible. And really, the story to that, if you read the books and you know what happens to more deep um Paul more deep um really amazing and I'm really interested to see how they knock it off I won't say what that is um but yeah it is really incredible um I, and the, the the writer um oh my brain's not all there today but yeah the writer incredible that that the third book incredible yep you'll be good David I'm sure my man you'll be fine well prepared yep um martian chronicles yeah i haven't actually read the martian chronicles my partner has um yeah so yeah yeah i need to check that out though yeah really exactly red eye it's, it's nothing not not excuse me sorry um nothing to do with us uh really ultimately um we know yeah the engine at the back of the plane is used for electrical generation and directs hot air from the jet to start the turbines of the main engine that's why you only see a small fuel tanker yeah right okay cool nice mike thank you do you think ornamentation on the buildings moves the electromagnetic energy and causes sound to move it's very possible now the more i've looked at the old world building sophie is that i found the ornate patterns and structures they have maybe they there is a type of geometry in them that reacted with some other type of frequency you know there, there'll be a lot of explanations in our mainstream world to what they are and why they are but um i i yeah some of the um some of these these you know the ornate patterns at the top of the pillars and stuff like this i believe that they could have been some sort of geometry that lifted I don't know. Did did certain had an effect on us? Yeah, cool. Let me know. Yeah, that's right, Sophie. Yeah, Stonehenge, of course. I'd say all stone circles. You know, like so many stone circles. You go up to the tip of Scotland. You got the Callany stones, and they're out in the middle of nowhere. And these are massive stones. Some of these twelve, sixteen feet high. Uh, but all over the place, the, the stone circles. You know, like some of these standing stones, they would have been near impossible and. Oh, the way we're told about it is that they would have been, you know, using sticks and pulling them along and sticks and putting them up. I don't think they were. There was something very sophisticated. The technology back then, it was completely different to the way we use technology today. So 100% Sophie. Yeah, nice, David. Let me know. That's right, Mike. They would use the ley lines and the magnetic field and, and the magnetism of the earth. Uh, that's why going back to the bees this is how the bees travel around and, and most birds to be honest isn't it i mean birds are migrating in that way so you know they pull to the magnetism uh most people will just totally dismiss that and but i believe probably humans somewhere uh you know we're pulled to uh certain places as well without even realizing maybe in a different way nowadays maybe done more through advertisement but it, we, we're kind of magnetically pulled to buy things and advertisement pulls you in yeah, a different type of magnetism but yeah the natural magnetism the natural world using this all the time you know um you know <laughs> you know just find uh, autonomously you just end up walking around in places because you're getting pulled magnetically to all these different locations yeah we didn't have that worry in 17 it was a typical day yeah yeah i don't know what you mean by that mist but yeah i you know if you mean 217 or what are you seven you, what you when you were 17 <laughs> um but the levitation uh yeah i answered that mike general motors research yeah they did yeah general motors i mean but there's a lot of suppression on engines and stuff like that there's a lot of other type of plans you only have to look at nicola tesla's plans and they're all out on the web and also what i mentioned earlier victor Scharberger which people don't really know about this guy, which is quite shocking. I, I do know somebody that works in that sort of field of work. And when I mentioned Victor Scharberger to him, he, he didn't actually know who he was, but he's a very intelligent guy. So it's not in the mainstream and it's not recognised in the mainstream, which is a shame because it is absolutely incredible what he was doing. Yeah. Yeah, nothing exactly, Red Eye. 
Yeah, nothing. Burger, mate. Yeah. Uh, turbine. Where am I going with all these comments? How many more comments have I got? I've got oh, coming up to the end. Um, 20th December 31st. Yeah, yeah. Turbine cars were made in the 60s, which ran on any liquid. Ignite even peanut oil. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's right. And I believe even the tanks they used in the Afghan, in the Middle East, and when they were out in the desert, they could use any liquid as well. So the military complex have all this technology. Uh, they can run any vehicle, like uh, very sophisticated vehicles, right? So obviously, if, you, if you're a tank in the middle of the desert, you can't run out of fuel. So you've got to have a, a self-fueling system, be able to fill it up with water, maybe even your own urine, <laughs> if, you know, but whatever, you know, that, that would make sense. Um, but yeah, the technology is out there. So yellow, um, Tim, so uh, here we go. So some say God the creator imploded itself. Very possible. Who knows? Maybe, maybe that's the inversion. <laughs> maybe. So yellow, me and my brother and two uncles saw a UFO, a rural area of North Portugal in 1996. I learned recently that the place is under a line and magnetic phenomenon. Very much though, yeah. So UFOs and all types of um, UAPs, as they're called now, uh, as well, um, they are sighted on ley lines. Crop circles as well, all this type. And they are used, that, that's a form of magnetism. So... I believe UFOs use this technology as well to some to some level to go from A to B. It's not possible to be able to steer or they are actually imploding in itself and almost folding space time, which is pretty far out and not something that's really described much in the world we're in today. So Artem, um, I'd love to learn about crop circles. Apparently, people's observed levitating humming orbs of energy around them yeah there has been sightings of them um of these there are videos out there of orbs over crop circles how real they are and authenticated i don't know there is an old one i remember from back in late 90s that was recorded uh, i believe down in silbury or around that area of wiltshire in england and that was these little orbs that were flying around. And yeah, amazingly, in seconds, they created what seemed to be a circle. But it's very hard to see these. But yeah, crop circles, they're very real. And these, some of these circles are too complex to build. And there are some, 100%, that are 100% fake. There has been a lot of fake people doing it. But they, these crop circles say a lot. There's some crop, But some of the crop circles... <laughs> would be near impossible to build and also as well the way the hay is patterned in there in in the actual um laid out so yeah there, there's a, there and there probably was a humming donut nice to see you hello my love how are you doing my dear um so uh yellow garduna mountains right okay is that another i'll check that out there is also another way to look at how the secret advanced tech works with this place as they know how to manipulate the source of codes of this matrix. Very possible, Mike. Um, yeah, and, and yeah, of course. Well, look, if we're in this, everything's a frequency. If everything is ultimately frequency sound at the base of it, even us and everything around this world and what this is, it's frequency and sound. If you understand that frequency and you can tune into that frequency, and you can, you know, adapt that frequency or manipulate it. Yeah, you could, of course. Like, we only see 2% of our field of vision, right? So actually, what is actually in front of us, we're only seeing 2% of that field. And that's that's mainstream. <laughs> it's funny, you can't go, you go with some of the mainstream, and then you're like, oh, that makes sense, yeah. But we are only, just whatever, even it's 2%. We are seeing a fraction, 100%. And... When we tune out of that frequency, certain frequencies like television sets and these kind of things and, and, and probably certain technologies as well. I'd say some mobile phones. Uh, I'd even say some of the apps that you look at have a frequency to them. So it's tuning into that frequency. But yeah, if you can step out of that frequency and I would suggest people try meditation and ways of connecting into your inner energy and you'll find that actually you will attune to these other frequencies. There are all these frequencies all around us, all over the place. So yeah, I'm sure that does get manipulated, um, Mike. And it goes on. And it's a sad, very sad situation that because we don't need that. 
we we you know we don't need to hide it and that's where we've been for a long long time um definitely uh, you know for for a few hundred years at least it's been very kept quiet kept in the dark all this and you know frequency it's a it's uh you know it, it's all there you know it's all around us and it's a matter of tuning ourselves to it and us human beings are very powerful we have a huge power innate power inside ourselves and when we can tune into that yeah we can tune into these frequencies and there's probably people that like to do that and manipulate that in a darker way as well unfortunately but you know we don't have to do that we can do that in a positive way as well so there's ways of tuning in abundance and the field of abundance and there's a field of money there's fields of all these frequencies around us and they are interfered with no doubt no doubt right okay so this is why you can't have a nice things in today's headlines u.s government awards northrop gun runham contract to create railroad railroad on moon concept right well there you go so they're actually building on the moon that's interesting now yeah uh it's so interesting the moon i we did a whole video on the hidden history series and when you start looking into the history of the moon and 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 okay i know some of you won't believe that we've even been to the moon but I do believe we've been to the moon. I just think that what maybe has happened and what, what's out there might be a bit different to what we're told, maybe. Uh, it's very possible that. Um, but yeah, the, the, that's interesting with the moon. So they're building like, wow, a railroad moon concept. Right, wow, okay. So even British Leyland made a turbine engine car. Well, yeah, it doesn't surprise me. And probably got taken off the market because it couldn't make... Or, right, yeah, just the concept. Well, yeah, because it couldn't make money or, you know, reach reach the um, amount, you know, make the profit that it needed to make. You see, if everybody had a free energy car, well, I won't call it a free energy car because that, that but if everyone had a, um, a self-sustaining car, so it actually fueled itself, yeah, I mean, what would happen? The, the, the system of oil would collapse, all these things. So we know all this. This, this is... Um, and donut sorry sir hello sir sorry i i'm just sometimes saying my love so well anyway i call you my dear my, <laughs> my dear sir <laughs> so nice to see you donut and um yeah the moon is yeah that's true it was brought at a different time period and it's very possible that it was part of the fragments of maldek which goes back way way back and that goes into the anuarchy and all these kind of various um subjects which is a whole other live or podcast we'll do one day um cool nice red eye i'll check that out yeah how timothy i agree how about yeah we don't really need to build out on the moon it's hilarious isn't it i mean we're doing all this space travel and all these things that are coming about at the moment and you can see that we are probably in the next 30 years and i mean publicly will be on mars i do believe it's possible uh that we have already visited mars and we have already visited these places but you know that's from some of the theories and ideas that you read but um the moon makes cold or cooling light um anyone can measure it okay measure it well i'll check that out espress thank you very much i will have a look and um look if anybody wants to buy our book we do have a new book coming out very soon and that I will be doing a podcast with Stephen very soon. I'm still trying to sort out how I get both of us on screen through this software because the last time, last week's, and thank you everybody who came along last week because it went completely wrong. That's why I've done this background just in case the green screen went again and it was just all green because I didn't like it having it all green. But um yeah, so we have got a new book coming out called uh, called A Luminous Worlds, and that will be available on Amazon very soon. And we also have our old book, which was, God, I mean, wow, amazing how time flies. But this was done, printed back on early or mid-2023 now, or, yeah, early 2023. It's Mysterious Realities, and that's got lots of fantastic information in there. And that's got little bits on acoustic levitation as well. I believe we've got it coral castle i cannot remember because i think we wrote that in the next one on coral castle but you've also got my book as well human inversion and i did wrote this because of the crazy times that we are in and i 
sort of wrote it from my perspective of my own journey of life. So what I've gone through, um, but it really does connect with now and where we are in society and what we need to do. People, you know, a lot of stuff's going on out there. So it isn't a good time to really check in with the self and really look at one's own stuff and really sort out our own spaces the best we can. So yeah, Donut, you can see it on the, uh, it's on the previous, I uploaded it again, actually. I actually put a background on it this time around, so it just looked a little bit better. But thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming to the live. Appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you for being in the chat, everyone in the chat and outside of the chat. I'm not sure how many people actually came in tonight because I haven't got any numbers up on my screen, but maybe I should. And... I hope I've answered everybody's questions. So we've got 50 people watching. That's great. Well, nice to have you all here. Thanks, everybody. And please subscribe if you haven't. You can also join my Patreon or, or become a channel member. And I have lots of exclusive content in there. And you can check out lots of other videos coming up as well. I've got lots of podcasts. Primarily, I'm actually a filmmaker. So that's my heart and passion, what I love to do. But my research on films and what I write about and stuff, it pulls in all this information. And that's why I want to talk about it on the channel. So you can actually see the podcast as well as Sacred Wisdom Podcast. And Stephen will be coming back and doing much more as well. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody's made it. David, I always know you're here, my man. Everybody in Red Eye, thank you for coming. Eagle Hunter, thank you. Wishing everybody well. Donnie Wicks, Miss Dragon, uh paradox fossils thank you my friend nice to see everybody here enslaved by truth thank you john keely nice to have everyone at brown dwarf everybody coming along thank you mike nicholas thanks for everyone's comments thank you everyone that's subscribing thank you everyone on the channel for lifting this channel and making it what it is because it, it, it wouldn't be it's all down to you for watching and engaging it i i make the content i just put myself out there because you know i want to spread this information and talk about it and discuss more and talk you know it's really important we all chat about this and spread this information so we all move to a better place and we move to a better society which we will do so thank you everybody much appreciation to you all and I'll see you soon. Thank you.